Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for coming to our session. Uh, it's good to see you all here. Uh, my name is Jane Palmer. I am a professorial lecturer in the Department of Justice, Law, and Criminology in the School of Public Affairs. I'm also the director of a program called Community-Based Research Scholars that hopefully you've heard of. If you haven't, I'm available afterwards to tell you all about it. I'm Garrett Grady Lovelace, professor in the School of International Service here at AU and deeply engaged um, in the benefits and challenges of community-based learning in the teaching uh, realm and in the research realm. Um, so we're excited to share with you a little bit today about how we've incorporated community-based research into our classes, some of the benefits, some of the challenges, and then talking about strategies to be able to do this better, more sustainably, more mutually beneficial with the community, that sort of thing. Um, so this is our brief agenda. Um, we have a, um, there's post-its for a couple activities we're going to be doing with the flip charts. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about what community-based research is. Uh, what some examples that we've uh, participated in uh, in community-based research in our courses, uh, how you can incorporate it into your course, benefits, challenges, any incentives or external funding, um, and then some Q&A at the end. Okay, so we want to talk to you briefly about what brings us to be in front of you all today. Would you like to go first? Um, sure. So I actually come about this from the standpoint of um, I've devoted my life to academia, but I'm very uh, familiar with its various flaws. And I think the separation of academia from the communities that it draws upon and it serves, allegedly, is one of the chief intellectual and logistical challenges of academia right now. So I'm committed to thinking through what the public good mission of higher education academia is. And I think community-based research has a great deal of potential, but there's all kinds of structural disincentives. So I'm very fascinated in supporting it and learning about how people are doing this in their own disciplines and work, and thinking through an infrastructure to support and acknowledge and respect and advance this work in teaching and in research. Yeah, great. So um, we were really excited to see that the theme of this year's com conference was the scholar-teacher ideal, because we see community-based research in the classroom setting as the scholar-teacher ideal. And so I come at this work from, I'm a former social worker, I was a social worker for many years in Chicago and St. Louis, um, and so the, uh, I'm most comfortable in the community. And so when I became an academic, I, I had to figure out a way to do both. And so the Community-Based Research Scholars Program was created in 2014. I was tapped to direct that uh, after a donation by an alum. Um, and I was able to incorporate my nonprofit experience. I was an executive director and a, a youth worker and a, a counselor and advocate um, with what I do in the classroom with students and really have be that bridge between the community and, and the, um, the academy. Also in my personal research, I just uh, got a grant for a researcher practitioner partnership uh, research project with the Victim Rights Law Center in Boston. So I also incorporate this sort of, I have my teaching side and my research side like we all do, I'm trying to integrate them, but I'm doing both community-based research in my research and with my students. And so if you're interested in any of this, I'm happy to serve as a resource for either of those things. So we wanted to briefly go around and hear who's in the room. I did peek at the attendee list, um, so I know a little bit, but you know some people um, uh, might be here that weren't on that list. And so if you could just say your name and uh, your department or school or affiliation. Um, and then on a scale of one to five, one being uh, I'm brand new to this, five being I've been doing this for 300 years, okay, maybe less, but um, your sort of confidence level in sort of um, doing community engaged teaching and or research. Who would like to go first? So maybe? Oh, way back. back. Great. Hi, I'm Jesse Myler. I'm in um, environmental science and fourth. Great. Marcy? Uh, hello, Marcy Campos, director of the Center for Community engagement service, so I'm more trying to find out who's doing this and how my office can be a resource for everyone. Uh, my name is Jerry Hush. I'm an adjunct uh, lecturer in sociology, uh, coming in from 20 years in the UN system where I've been trying to balance theory and practice action. This kind of so I'm actually going to give myself a five. Great. Oh, yeah. Hey, good morning. Stacey Merida, Colgan School of Management and School of Business in the Management Department and this uh, first year I'm Sarah Biggs, I'm the Special Assistant for Provost, so I don't really do this in my current work, but I uh, want to uh, know how to support it. Great. Hi, I'm Sarah Biggs, I'm the Special Assistant for Provost, and I'm 
Great. That's great. Let's actually keep on this side. Um, go ahead. I'm Alex Godwin, a uh, new faculty in computer science. I do data visualization. I try to focus on civic data visualization. Great. I'm Brett Fielder. I'm an associate professor in the management department at COGOD, and I'm probably around a three. Great. Welcome. I'm Dan Myers. I will be the provost of this university in five more days. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I, I didn't do this kind of research when I was a faculty member, but I think it's very important. And it was, a, it was a big push at my last job. I created a new office for community-engaged research um, oh, when I was there and uh, did a lot of really great things. I think that office did a lot of really great things in terms of connecting up in a in an organic way, uh, what was happening so uh, between the community and the university. So it's something that I think is very important for us to be doing. And I know that you're interested in doing that here, and it's one of the things that attracted me to American sports. Wonderful. Great to hear. I'm Emily Amlareth, and I am in the Office of Development and Alumni Relations. Um, so one. <laughs> uh, but similar to other colleagues, uh, how our office can maybe help support in these endeavors with our alumni and community. Yeah, it highlight programs. what we're doing. Yeah, yeah that's great. great. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Mary Alice McMillan. I'm an MFA student, so not a future, hopeful future educator. Um, so a one for sure. Okay, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm Stacy Marion. I'm a librarian, so I am here to help you find the resources that you need to teach in your class. Thank you. I'm Catherine Ray. I'm also one of the librarians, but DC history is my subject area, so I give myself a five on my That's personal good. research. And the way that I could be happy to show any of you how we can, uh, we have some data visualization software at the library as well. We have a GIS librarian. So there are many things we can do to help you with the academic support for your programs. Wonderful. Great. Thank you. Great. Okay. I am Singerman in government in SPA, um, and uh, I work on urbanism with a community in Cairo, mm -hmm. but I don't really, a lot of my research, but not as much teaching in the classroom, so maybe a two. Hi, I'm Irene Kellys. I'm um, in the Critical Race, Gender, Cultural Studies Collaborative. I am an anthropologist, so I'm really steeped in kind of field work, community-based, mm -hmm. and I've always been just really interested in and doing it, you know, and approaching community engagement in meaningful ways that don't just kind of perpetuate paternalistic kind of dynamics and power dynamics and having students kind of learn that kind of reciprocal kind of relationship. So I'll give wonderful. myself between a four and a five. I think there's always good something to learn. So that's great. We that's can do decimals. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm qualitative. <laughs> <laughs> Um, hi everybody, my name is Nabina Lebo and I'm the director of the CAS LEAD, that's a leadership and ethical development right. program. And um, I put myself at a one um, because I don't have very much experience at all with community-based learning or research, but I'm hoping to develop a community-based learning course for my CAS LEAD students um, for not this spring, but the spring after. So I was really excited when I saw this session uh, listed. Wonderful. Thanks. Welcome. Hello, my name is Christopher Lipinski. I'm a graduate student in the School of Communications. And so I put myself at a one. Welcome. Welcome. Um, my name is Danielle Sudani. I'm the director of the Institute for Innovation and Education in the School of Education. Um, we, I support faculty in their research and um, work in, and a lot of what we do is with DC teachers in the community. I'm not exactly sure how to rank myself. I'm going to go lower on the two end. But <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Welcome. Um, Carolyn Parker, I direct graduate teacher education at the School of Education. Um, and I'd rank myself maybe between a three and a four. Hi, I'm Carmen Elena Rosa. I work for the World Languages and Poetry Department. I teach business Spanish. And I'm in the middle. Uh, uh, part of my project is to have my students go to the Latino communities and work with the Latinos entrepreneurs. So this is very important for me to learn. I would like to engage my students to a community-based learning project or course. Great. That's great. Yeah. Sean Bates, School of International Service. Uh, I teach cross-cultural communication and global governance, so would love to talk to you about coming and talking to a class. Um, <laughs> and would like to connect both of those more with our communities here in DC. I've done a bit of it, but not in 
as systematized a way as I would like. Um, and so I'm going to call it a two and a half to three. Thank you. Good morning. I think it's still morning. Um, <laughs> my name is Erica Garnett. I'm in the um, Orientation, Transition, and Retention office. And I put myself around the two. Um, I've done some work in community organizing and with living learning communities and service learning. But it's been a while, so. Thanks, Erica. Welcome. Hi, guys. Hi, Harry. Hi, Harry. <laughs> uh, my name is Harry Gilead, and I work in the Center for Community Engagement and Service. Um, and so um, I actually manage the community based learning and the community service learning program here at the university. Um, and so Marcy might have mentioned earlier the director about like the presentation. So I would be one of the ones that would come around to give presentations sort of about community based learning here at AU. Um, so if you definitely can interest it, come uh, hit me up. Um, and I would give myself sort of like a four because there's always things to like learn. And so I'm, I don't know everything, so I'm always learning. And I did set you all up by saying 300 years. Is your, is your experience four or five? Which was you know, an exaggeration, but yeah, you're probably a five, but you can call yourself a four. Tony? Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Tony Hollinger. And um, now my title is Director of Initiative for Student Engagement and Diversity. Um, for the most of the time I've been here at AU, I was the director of all of our facilities operations. Those, that transition is important because I'm either a avid, lifelong learner and engager, or I'm kind of confused on what I ultimately want to do. <laughs> I've done a lot of different things, but um, most everything I do always ends up with me finding a way to engage with people in the community. Mm. So from a leadership perspective, a business perspective, whatever it is, it, I always end up having to be rooted in, uh, in the people uh, and, and again, in the community in general. So um, I'd say four in, in practice, but I'm a part. Of, I'm enjoying being at AU, so I can you know get that up to a more uh, refined level by listening to what you guys have. Great, thank you. Thanks. So much expertise in the room. Yes. It's very exciting. Great. Welcome. <laughs> so. Just a quick plug for the Center for Community Engagement and Service. Marcy and Harry are your, your resources there. They have a Faculty Fellows Institute every May for those that want to learn how to more, like spend you know, a boot camp on how to do community-based learning in your classroom and get an official designation of community-based learning for your, for your course. So please rely on them. We're going to focus primarily on community-based research, but it's a form of mm -hmm. community-based learning or community-engaged learning, or some people also use the word service learning, right? How do we do that community university bridge um, that's mutually beneficial and respectful and not patronizing, mm -hmm. right? And not tokenizing and not going into the community, taking what we need and leaving and being like, see ya, right? I was trained in community-based participatory research by a group of amazing native researchers that I worked on a violence against women in a tribal communities project with, and I learned a lot from them, and I especially learned how exploitative and abusive researchers have been for hundreds and hundreds of years. And as a, as a doctoral student, you know, I became very committed to not being that researcher, right? And so I always bring their voices and what I learned from them into everything that I do. So community-based participatory research is collaborative. It's designed to ensure and establish structures for participation by the communities affected by the issue being studied. When I talk to new community-based research scholars, I say, our philosophy is the people affected by an issue should be the ones informing the solutions to the issue. Too often we have people who think they know who don't actually know, right? So with community-based research, you have the communities affected by an issue being studied, integrated, and part of the project. And it's all aspects of the research process. It's not just sort of like, oh, we interviewed some people, right? They're part of the design, they're part of the data collection, they can be if they opt to, you know, it's, it's all a choice, like we're not forcing anyone to do anything. Part of the data analysis, and they're especially part of the dissemination of the information, right? How do we take what we learned and not just publish it in academic journals, excuse me, no, I'm just kidding. Um, how do we just, and, and get it out to the people who can use it for policy, for advocacy, for creating a new program and nonprofit, right? To improve health and well-being and in social change, right? And so there's a very sort of action focus to this. Um, and there's lots of words for it. If, if Gary, you want to mention this briefly. I've been compelled by how some of this work is taught as being volunteer or kind of some charity work, when in fact it's the most intellectually rigorous work that can happen. If you do a research or a survey with an affected community, a frontline community, and there's no trust there, and there's a history of academic exploitation, 
why would those community members even give you an honest response in their survey? Like, why would they share their struggle and their pain? So even on the level of um, learning about an issue and learning rigorous intellectual quantified or quantitative qualitative data, there would need to be the trust with a community that they themselves are leading intellectually, the analysis or the research design process and long-term iterative dialogic process of analysis and collaboration on intervening and understanding the problem at hand. So, um, in so many disciplines, community-based research has long intellectual histories. In Latin American studies, Latin American research, there's long histories of this. Um, Anti-racist research, feminist research, participatory action research, in sociology, and public health, and history, I mean, of course, public history. So I think part of what we're thinking of doing is highlighting and linking all of the rich academic lineages in this work and uplifting them. And not saying this is kind of a newfangled thing or it's not really intellectually rigorous. Um, so I'd love to kind of think about an intellectual space where we can think about um, the deep um, intellectual traditions we're drawing upon and the, um, particularly the decolonizing. I think of myself as a decolonial scholar. Um, so there is, academia has a colonial heritage to it. And what if community-based research, a community partner, or even community-led research is a way to decolonize deeper academic assumptions about the world at large? Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. So the idea behind it is, you know, there's some sort of traditional research, more traditional research, where you do research on a community, right? How do we go across the continuum? Maybe we're doing it in the community, right? Community-based, and then eventually this more community-based participatory research that's with, side by side, the community. And so the other idea, the other main point that I make with the community-based research scholars is like, we don't go in saying like, we want to study this topic. We go in and saying, hey, we're here as a resource, what do you need? What would be helpful to you? What do you want to know? Right? You could say, like, oh, I think teen pregnancy is really a problem in this DC public school. We need to go in and do a study about that. We go in and they say, access to higher education is our problem. That's what we need to focus on. Right? It comes from them instead of it coming from us. It's collaborative throughout. Strengths of all partners are utilized. And like I said, findings are disseminated in an accessible way. It's not always easy, but it's worth the effort that you put into it because of what you get out of it. It does take a lot of patience. You have to build that trust. Um, as a former social worker and nonprofit director, I can build trust relatively quickly with some nonprofits because like I've been sort of in the trenches. I don't like that. I don't like to use violent analogies, but I've, I've you know, I, I, I can kind of say that. And not all faculty members will have that sort of like background, but you have to take the time, go to their fundraisers, go to their events, get to know the community, um, um, use uh, friends of friends to get introductions, that sort of thing, to build that trust. People aren't gonna just trust you immediately. AU has a great reputation due to the work of, of <coughs> Marcy and Harry and, and all the other people on campus who have done this community engaged learning for a long time. We do have a great reputation. So sometimes I can call them and be like, oh, I love AU, yeah, come on in. Sometimes it's not that easy because there have been missteps or there's turnover in nonprofit. So it's a new person who's like, I just got here, I don't know anything about your university. And so you don't assume trust, right? Communication is really, really important. Flexibility, I could tell you lots and lots of stories of ways in which some of our students, I don't know if you guys have noticed this, want things to go sort of linearly and like they wanna know what to expect and they wanna know exactly what's gonna be on the exam, that sort of thing. They gotta throw that out the window when we do this. And I love it, because it's such a growth process for them. Mm. First day of data collection at one of our sites, remember uh, a few years ago, those of you who have been here, uh, they shut down the metro for 24 hours, because they were like fires and they had to repair it. That was the first day we were supposed to go out into the community, right? And, I, and you know, you have that Wednesday set aside, can't do it again until the next Wednesday, because the schedules are that sort of thing, and we just had to roll with it, right? Stuff like that has happened almost every year. <laughs> and um, I don't know if I'm cursed or something, but more than a curse, it's such a great lesson for the mm -hmm. students. We had it all planned out, and we gotta wait till next week, right? Um, and then openness. Not only to sort of the process and being patient with the process and sort of all the curveballs that might come, but also you don't know what you're gonna find, and you can't promise your nonprofit partner that you're gonna be able to like give them the data that will give them the best grant they've ever written, right? You don't know what you're going to find, and you just have to be open to, open to what you learn along the way. Okay, so I'm going to briefly talk about some examples 
of uh, projects we've done in community-based research scholars. We're in our fifth year. Um, and these are just some photos from uh, different uh, projects uh, that we've done. Um, I'm just going to name a couple of these, but I put them all up here for you to be able to see them. This is since the beginning of CBRS, what we've done, in, it's, it's a class called community-based research. So the first year we did a community needs assessment for a community action anti-poverty organization in DC. Um, the second year we worked with two different public charter schools to look at uh, the impact of, um, my, my Angela Public Charter School has a really cool residential program where the students stay from Sunday to Friday morning and um, get homework help and have like a quiet place to study and they have a friendship group and that sort of thing. So we, we did an evaluation of that that program and the LAYC Career Academy needed uh, some assistance around a retention and attrition. Thrive DC, we did in-depth interviews with people experiencing homelessness. Um, then last year, Garrett and I uh, both taught, each taught a section of the community-based research class for community-based research scholars and we focused on food insecurity with the Latin American Youth Center and DC Hunger Solutions. So we kind of had a different and theme And the freshmen year. created SNAP applications for eligible SNAP residents in DC, online applications and for elders that did not exist. These are freshmen doing actual projects that now DC Hunger Solutions uses. Right. Very and timely. Right. Very for SNAP work. applications, exactly. <laughs> And that's the other thing. Community-based research scholars is for first-year students, so also don't think you have to have like graduate students doing this stuff. Um, there's also the option for community-based research scholars and any undergraduate student um, at AU to enroll in the community-based research certificate program um, that I also direct, um, where after they do a class-based project, they later in their college career they do an independent study capstone. And we've had uh, almost, a, now at this point every semester we have about five students at different, indivi doing individual uh, projects with a faculty mentor, um, community-based research projects where they take what they learned in the class and in other classes and implement it in a, in a project. So I'm happy to talk about those as well. Um, so we had the freshman and the undergraduate um, experience of this. And then on the graduate level, I've led a practicum, which is a graduate capstone practicum for master students, second year master students, and some PhD students have been involved. And the practicum model is to work with a client, comes from the business school, so maybe, and often, oftentimes at SIS it's the World Bank or the IMF or the DOD or the CIA. We switched it around. Instead of having a formal client, we had community partner. So we worked with a frontline grassroots group of organizations, rural coalition, largely minority farmers, farm workers, tribal growers, um, Latina immigrant growers, and National Family Farm Coalition. And it's been going on since 2013. We've hosted their annual meetings at SIS. Um, we've done um, large meetings at the USDA where they bring their needs for policy reform to public elected officials. And then we do as students, the grad students and I do the work of making sure they've got the maps that they need or the data collection background or the quantitative or the qualitative research they need to kind of do their outreach or their education or their lobbying um, and their fundraising. These have been international. They've gone to Slow Food International in Italy and presented based on community uh, works, um, um, com practicum students' works. And they've also had poster sessions where grad and undergrads present their work to the community partners and get feedback. So there's the whole kind of life cycle of research. Um, each of these meetings, we decided to have them culminate with the community partners discussing what their research needs were. And for some people in the community, this is new to really like think about, okay, so what data do I really need and what could you do on a semester long basis? So it's been an iterative project to have um, a research need that could be done by the grad students involved, but we've had some exciting deliverables. Students have traveled across the country to meet with farmers, um, tribal reservations, um, on the border with farm workers. Um, and so um, we've got this kind of process. We start early, um, the communities are the experts. Um, we're considering the student experience. Some students come in with a lot of video skills, um, some you know, with social media skills, with some great quant skills, and we match the students' skill sets and interests and intellectual and professional goals with the community partner needs. And that's a dance, but after a few years, we kind of have you know, some projects go to, that are going. Lots of deliverables have come out of this, from oral histories to GIS maps to econ analysis to lit reviews. Um, and so we have at farmbillfairness.org, some of them uh, posted. But our community groups have used these in congressional briefings. We have another congressional briefing planned in April with the new Congress folks. Um, public education resources, 
successful graduate doctoral program and job applications. This is real life skill work that's both intellectually um, grounded, but also very, um, very useful and applicable in the world at large. And what was interesting is the community partners after last uh, 2017, uh, we d we, the grad students delivered their, their briefing reports, which were not brief, they were 100 pages each, <laughs> on various aspects of farm bill and farm labor, farm worker and justices. And the community partners said, this is so good, can you please publish it so we can use it and cite it when we talk to the people in Congress? And we were like, but publishing it is academic, don't you want it more in a blog form? And they said, we love blogs, but can you also get it under peer review? And so we've now just begun, and so it's finally happened. And a lot of times you're working with alumni who've graduated, because two years is so short, sit out in the workforce, and we're meeting after their work hours to kind of get things through peer review. But we now have this really great batch of peer-reviewed scholarship based on the data that we've done that now our, our community partners are using when they talk to um, their public officials and really leveraging this data. Um, so there's benefits, there's also so many challenges. It also, this kind of research actually counters how I've been trained as a scholar and as a researcher. I've been trained to kind of think about people as data points, but now I'm thinking about them as experts. It counters what a lot of students are taught about how knowledge formation and knowledge production works. So the benefits outweigh the challenges, but I think Jane and I are so compelled with how to really articulate the challenges so as to build more institutional support. Um, so now we're going to break and have you all brainstorm based on your experiences what you think are the most pressing challenges and most exciting benefits or kind of the urgency or need of community-based research and learning. Um, and so we've got, uh, we've broken it up into benefits to the students. And I feel like this is actually the easy one. Like the students walk away with so much knowledge um, and thus the, there's benefits to the students. There's benefit to us as faculty and to us as a staff in the university at large, um, but if you wanted to kind of articulate that, that would be great. And then benefits the community. A little more elusive, but ultimately the goal. Um, and we're thinking community, both com the community partners themselves, but then the broader society, broader community. If this was really see, advanced, yeah. what would be some of the um, benefits? And then the challenges, both to community um, and the challenges of the students, faculty, and university. So if you could just, uh, there's post-it notes around if you take out a pen um, um, and just think, you write one or two, we're not going to spend a long time on this, um, but I, I, we want to use, capitalize on who's in the room and just, what do you think? What are the benefits? What are the challenges? Maybe do at least one benefit and one challenge, um, or if you're an overachiever, one for, each over, one for each flip chart, benefit for community, benefit for the university, challenges for the community, challenges for the university, and then eventually we're going to have a conversation about how to address these challenges. Um, and so just write on the post-it and then paste it up there. And I'll be taking pictures once they're done, the chronicles. Yes. Sure. No, I, yeah. So anyway. Yeah. Just, so let's I briefly talk about uh, what you came up with. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about benefits and challenges before we get to strategies. Um, but just off the top of your head, or if anyone wants to share theirs, or one that they saw, let's talk about uh, benefits to the community, one or two. Who'd like to share a benefit for the community in doing this kind of coursework? Yes, Terry. I think there's a sense that communities uh, are heard. I mean, there's a, 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 it's moving outside of just perhaps a geographic location or a network of people, and that there is a way in which the concerns or the interests or the, the questions are being brought into a broader sphere. Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> something? Did you have something? No, this was no work. Oh, this always happens. <laughs> <laughs> That's us. Uh, it's one and a half. Uh, and it's actually funny. Um, I told this story the other day, but I don't think any of you were in the room. Um, I teach violence against women usually, and there was this one class where I was like, it was a really heavy day, and everyone was so depressed. And we were just having a really heavy cut. And then all of a sudden, all of their faces brightened simultaneously, and they were smiling. And I was like, what just happened? <laughs> and I turned around, and like my sunset um, screensaver had come on. And I was like, I'm just going to leave that right there. And <laughs> so that's kind of what just happened. And I was like, and they didn't realize it. Um, what's another benefit for the community? Voices being heard. Research that they might not have the resources for, and also um, free labor. 
Yes, we have a lot of resources here. And I was a nonprofit director. I did not have time. I thought I understood research. I was like, we're going to do a pre and post test, and it's going to be beautiful. And it was like crap. Excuse me. That's a technical term. But <laughs> it was crap. And partnering with the university would have so enhanced not only my understanding of the impact of what we were doing, but also our ability to write grants and understand and yeah. program reports and that sort of thing. Great. Yeah. And I would say on this, um, so many. Uh, organizations are under resourced right now and strapped for cash so to have the time and also youth bring social media skills and a whole set of kind of skills often that are not available in-house yes and, and they're also they're, they're the research that is coming from them is often not heard in many other mm -hmm. policy worlds or academic worlds as well yeah. yes I, I can't contain myself but the library has the um, the foundation center directory the uh, the um, professional okay. edition, so if you're looking for grants, it's available to you from your office. You don't have to come That's to the library. That's great. Great. And then what about benefits at the student level, faculty level, university level? I just put up there just kind of real life and real time learning. Yeah. You know, on both, and actually I, I kind of went back and forth. It's really obviously for um, both sides. Right, these are not usually exclusive, right? right? Mm -hmm. Great. What other benefits are there? Yes. Um, not from experience, so you can <laughs> tell me if I'm right, but I would think there are opportunities for fac the faculty going to see um, that there could be new scholarship that they could be doing outside of or on top of this, and also things that they can bring back to their classes to be saying this is what's actually happening in, in the community and that kind of thing. So enriching the, the life of the classroom. Yes, definitely, definitely. Yeah. And the students, you know, I'm five years in with CBRS, so I've seen students graduate, and, and how they take these experiences into their jobs post-college yes. is just phenomenal. I get emails all the time. Even a student that works at WUSA down the street is like, I'm using what I learned in CBRS yeah. as a journalist working for WUSA. Um, I mean, there's the more obvious ones that went into Peace Corps or Teach for America or like Obama Foundation, right? But then there's people like in, from COGOT or from School of Communications that are still using these principles, and it's amazing. I actually feel like the alumni layer of this, mm -hmm. um, my closest relationships with alumni students come from those whom we've traveled and visited with farmers or from work organizations, and they might have at the time of the SCTs not realized how deep that knowledge was or the honor of learning, you know, next to civil rights leaders or tribal leaders, but then when they got into the professional world, they kept drawing upon it, either through professional connections or just that kind of memory of real frontline experience and expertise. So even though it's a risk on the SCT, because in the throes of it, they're like, oh my gosh, this is so up in the air. But a year or two later, oh, they're right. emailing. So the student evaluation of teaching, right? Um, Getting to the challenges, <laughs> but it's a benefit ultimately right. to academia, to that relationship. Erica? I think also, um, since our students are so transient and are moving outside of DC or whatever after they graduate, I think this gives them an opportunity to understand how to be more of an active citizen in whatever mm. community they're a part of, mm -hmm. um, and really being able to critically analyze ways that they can get involved with their community and what those tools that those different communities Yeah, we're, it's a, it's, we're like building habits as undergrads that they can continue throughout their entire Yeah. Life. And but I'm civic working on measures to measure that longitudinally with my students of sort of civic engagement because I think that is a really important outcome. And that gets to development and alumni uh, relations as well. I mean, experience, we know that community-based learning is a high-impact mm -hmm. practice. We know that undergraduate research opportunities is a high-impact practice. We know that this kind of work, experiential learning, is how we, we learn by doing, mm -hmm. right? And so we are really setting our students up for success. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, so we just kind of threw together some benefits just in case they weren't captured, but um, uh, so these, some of these were mentioned. I like to talk about, I'm a, I'm a research methods nerd, so I like to talk about validity mm -hmm. issues. Some people really don't see community-based research as rigorous and kind of see it as sort of, um, oh, that's nice. But back to what Garrett said earlier around sort of once you build that trust, you can um, break down some walls that might prevent you from getting the real mm -hmm. data. So there's a really wonderful article. If you read any article about community-based participatory research, this is the one I want you to read. 
It's called The Dance of Race and Privilege in Community-Based Participatory Research. I will send it to you if you email it to me. And it talks a lot about this, how we have hidden transcripts and public transcripts and the importance of that, building that trust. And so I think it increases the validity of measurement, um, um, may increase understanding and application of the results. Uh, we've got this uh, cultural relevance, community perspectives. And then we're building capacity. When we worked with Maya Angelou Public Charter School, the young people were doing this hand in hand with us and came to, we, we offered to go to the community, but they wanted to come here because, that, because then we also did a college tour of the high school students. But my students presented their findings to the high school students to get feedback from them to whether they interpreted what they said correctly. Academics don't typically do that. Some really awesome ones do go back to where they, the community where they did their research and sort of kind of gut check first, but instead of you know, um, not doing that, but then we're building the capacity and in long term we want to have a partnership with these high schools where we're teaching them how to do research, right? Also, some nonprofits we've worked with, they, they keep the data sets that we created from the surveys we conducted, and then they use those in the future. I went to a fundraiser for Thrive DC, met a new person, new grant writer. She was like, oh, you're Dr. Palmer. I just last week used your data, and I found the statistic I needed for the grant to be able to support women who are, you know, whatever. So they're still using it years later. There's lots of challenges. Um, uh, we talked about distrust. We talked about um, what, how do we define the community. We haven't talked about that too much, but and what generalizability. Mm -hmm. We've got different priorities. Like I said, a lot of nonprofits are like, can you come in and, and do some research that shows how great everything we're doing is? I'm like, I'd love to, but that might not be what we discover, but hopefully that will be what we discover. <laughs> um, Timelines. We haven't talked about that too much, but we've got a 14, 15 week semester, mm -hmm. right? That's even being generous. Um, mm -hmm. And I will tell you that the capstone projects that I mentioned, I can think of three or four of them that really have taken two semesters. Um, and so they've had to get an incomplete until they finished it, but just because it's community-based research and things happen. Um, so with that, we can, we can be a little flexible with those independent studies, but with a 15-week course, my 300-level 15-week course, I can't be like, all right, 30 students, you're all getting an incomplete until we're done with our, you know, we're not gonna do that. So we have to be really, so I guess my, my tip there is don't be too ambitious, which is, failure of mine of being too ambitious. I learned that early on. Do something manageable for that semester and then figure out if there's other ways to support that community partner with their other needs, with another faculty member, another class. Another thing I do is I get requests and I refer them to the master's practicums or the capstones if they're out of our sort of wheelhouse or out of our sort of capacity and try to connect them with other folks um, and being realistic about what we can promise. I talked about the possibility of unfavorable findings, and then we've talked about the perception of it being non-rigorous. Right, so um, I'm looking forward to seeing your, your all's challenges, but some of the through lines that I've encountered are um, there is a long history of extractive, outright racist or patriarchal research, so it's going to take time to build up trust um, and show that this is this long-term commitment. Um, it doesn't end at the end of the semester. I've been going to funerals. I'm now deeply engaged with people and communities, and it's hard on the tenure track process. So there's all kinds of structural disincentives to the sheer um, time and relationships that this requires, but that's the real work, and that's life. So I feel like there's something about academia that's kind of shoved aside kind of the social life or the human or the emotional life that, I, that this kind of research forces us to overcome those dichotomies um, in a really productive way, I think. On an academic side, um, there was an article that I published about the organization that I work with, and the peer reviewers were like, oh, surely there's some internal drama here. And I was like, of course there's internal drama, but I'm not going to call it out. That would be, I would be, you know, on so many levels, that would, that would destroy all of the relationship and all the trust, and it's not even my place. Right. Um, and that's a whole kind of set of kind of academic assumptions that it would be my place to call out their, their kind of internal drama. So the whole um, arc of how you're contextualizing this work within academic research and you're actually putting up boundaries of I'm going to do the analysis of what's working and not working in this organization without calling out internal drama because that's not my place. So there's a whole change of academia that needs to happen in terms of what's expected or assumed that academics have privy to. Um, so I, there was an article that I'm working on right now about IRB. And IRB, of course, is wonderful. We love IRB, research ethics. Um, but IRB assumes that the people whom you're working with are objects of research in the human subject domain. Um, so what would it look like to have them be equal, epistemologically, experts on their own right? 
So memorandums of understanding is what I'm working on and trying to think through what is a, a memorandum of understanding that complements IRB. And my community partners have been calling this the terms of engagement. So before you embark upon a project, you sit down and have an honest conversation about what you want, what are your principles, what are the no, you know, where, where do you not go, where, what is your focus for this project, um, and set principles of practices, principles of partnerships, um, and so I'm developing this whole literature review about people who've used MOUs and how that's unfolded, and I hope to have that be a resource to people at AU, um, discipline specific, as we move toward this. At its best, such work is a tiny step in the larger journey or dance of decolonizing academia. Yeah, and I want to mention one quick thing about MOUs and IRBs. Carolyn and I had a conversation during the activity about IRBs. So we do memorandums, memorandums of understanding with all of our community partners for the class level and the capstone level projects, just so everyone knows what we can and can't do in this semester time frame. And those are really important and I think are non-negotiable to, to do. You also have to do IRB. Couple things about IRB. If it's just a class project and you're not planning on sending the students to the National Conference for Undergraduate Research to present or something like that or publish, you, you don't have to do IRB. Um, it's still good to do, but you don't have to do if it's just a class project. What I do every semester, and the IRB here is excellent. Yeah, My colleagues is. have complained about their IRBs left and right, but here, usually within two weeks, I hear back. I always do exemptions though. It's a little bit longer if you don't do an exemption. This is how you do an exemption. This is what I do for our spring class to expedite it. You don't collect names or identifiable information about the people you're talking with. You don't really need it anyway. Um, and so if it's anonymous and the human subjects are, human subjects, don't like that word, but are protected, their identities are protected, uh, you can qualify for an exemption. You don't get to decide you get an exemption. You have to, the IRB decides that your uh, research qualifies for an exemption, but you still have to apply. So I usually go through, project it on a board, fill it out with my students, show them what the questions are that they ask. They basically are asking how you're going to protect your vulnerable uh, part research participants. What's your informed consent look like, that sort of stuff. We still do informed consent even though we're exempt, just so everyone knows, the research participants know, uh, what their rights are, that they don't have to answer all questions, that they can exit at any time, all those sorts of things. But it really doesn't take very long. And um, the only times that we've cut it close with planning to go out in the community and not yet having IRB is when it was on me of submitting it like two days before we were going to go out. And then I call Matt and I'm like, hi, just wondering if you had a chance to look over it. And then they, they're really kind, but don't take advantage of their kindness, um, <laughs> despite how often I do. Um, so. Don't let IRB be a barrier. Um, we have a wonderful uh, IRB here that really supports this type of thing. Is that different if you're talking about minors? Okay, well that's yeah, DCPS, yeah. yeah. So well, no, these aren't DC. Well, they are what DCPS. we've done with minors is we had to get parental consent. Okay. So the right. staff that we work with at the school gets the parent to sign, and what we try to do is get it slipped into a pack of things that, not slipped in there so we can read it and know right. what it is, but have it part of a pack of things this parent already has to sign. So planning ahead sure. that it's part of the paperwork they're doing um, and that it's explained to them that they're a student will be participating in a research project and their participation will be anonymous and they can exit at any time and that sort of thing. Okay. So we've had to get parental consent in the past. Thank you. So it can be hard if you're working with like a, a youth homelessness organization. There's other sort of barriers there, but generally that's what you have to do if they're under 18. Okay. Couple quick things about power dynamics. Um, successful partnerships have power sharing, but there's inherent power of being a university going into a community, just by our affiliation. And so it's really about, um, I don't go by Dr. Palmer in the community. I mean, that's just like a basic thing, right? I'm Jane. Um, um, I tell my students, um, I have long conversations. That Dance of Race and Privilege um, article is really helpful. Long conversations with students about power, privilege, and inequality before we're going into the community. Um, mutual recognition. Like if AU is doing something about, look at Dane Palmer's class and how amazing they are. The nonprofit is up there with Jane Palmer's class, right? It's not just sort of like, look at Jane Palmer's project. It was a, it was a collaborative project. These are the things that can really negatively affect the partnership for your class, but also for American University. No pressure, right? But the, the nonprofits don't distinguish us as like, 
oh, she's from public health and she's from School of Public Affairs. We're all American University, and I've had experiences where I've gone into nonprofits, or we've been working collaboratively with nonprofits and not even realized another class was also working with that nonprofit, but they assumed we knew because they think, you know, they make sense. We're all just AU. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, unacknowledged issues of power and privilege, disrespect for the knowledge and expertise within the community, assuming not earning trust and respect, and then the biggest faux pas that a community-based researcher can do is disseminating the findings, especially identifying the community partner, without them first looking at it first, clarifying things. I mean, there have been times that we've just gotten the, gotten the findings wrong, where we've gone to meet with the nonprofit partner or the, the people that were participating in research, and they're like, yeah, that's nice and all, but that's not actually accurate from their, the community perspective. So the community has to be involved in, in putting together those deliverables and disseminating those findings and what makes sense for them. So this researcher practitioner partnership grant that I just received for the Victim Rights Law Center project, our deliverables first are webinars for lawyers and other people doing sexual violence work, uh, blogs, you know, those types of deliverables, and then going into academic uh, publishing. I really admire Garrett for being on the tenure track. I opted not to be on the tenure track because I, I wanted to be able to do this kind of work. So I love, love, love how much you are able to do this as a tenure track person because um, I worried that it would prevent me from this work. So I was it's really excited to meet you. <laughs> So we, got, we have to be a team as we embark upon this, which, which gets us to, there are resources at AU. The more we talk about this, the more I realize over at the law school, there's people doing amazing community public clinic <coughs> law, but it doesn't count for their um, you know, promotion and tenure, so they're kind of having their own struggle around this. Um, public health is doing this, you know, computer data visualization. Like in, in many corners, people are fighting this fight of how to do this work in their own discipline and have it be rigorous and intellectually important, but also deeply embedded within community values and community teaching. Um, so just a few things. Um, clearly, Marcy Campos, um, Harriet Center for Community Engagement and Service, the Humanities Truck, there's really kind of interesting work happening on that front. A new AU 2030 Social Equity Initiative has just been uh, embarked in 2018. Um, Jane's work at CBRS, the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center, Ibram Kendi's um, center, which just got going this year and is embarking in community-based research and teaching, so that'll be a, a, a priority for them, are just a few. Yeah, and just real quick about the Humanities Truck, if you haven't heard about it. It's basically like a food truck, but it's not. Um, it has amazing audiovisual recording. Um, it's a place to display research in the community or findings or art projects or that sort of thing or even they, there's recording capability if you want to do oral histories or something like that and go to the community instead of having them come to you. Um, and Dan Kerr's work, he's done a lot of really great community-based research with people experiencing homelessness and he's in charge of that project. And they, um, you can apply to be a fellow with them to be able to use the truck for any community-based research project or community-engaged project you're looking to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so very briefly, yes. um, AU heroically has led a regional effort called Incorporating Community Engaged Teaching and Scholarship into Promotion Tenure. It has an acronym, so it's real, I-C-E-T-S. Um, I have been trying with fewer people to expand it to reappointments. It's so many people who are doing this work are not on the tenure track. Um, and AU at this point is actually a leader regionally, but has yet to really implement it at home. So I feel like one of our takeaway tasks for us, since we've got all these great um, departments represented, is to think through how AU could really implement this unit by unit, discipline by discipline, um, even as it's also still maintaining its leadership on this front um, in the whole region. And this is through Campus Compact. Yeah, that's great. Um, so in just November 2017, we hosted the institute. It was the first institute here at AU at SIS. And these are the outcomes that came about over 2018 regionally. So these are the goals regionally, is to clarify the definition, synthesize elements, and draft an implementation plan. And of note, former AU provost, Bass, um, was lauding this. Um, and so we're very excited with the new leadership at AU, and we're thinking that there's just a lot of momentum around this, and we're really excited to see this um, be, be further advanced. Yes, wonderful. Um, and then just regionally, so much is happening on this, even around the country. So I just threw up some of these logos, and I'm collecting um, you know, links and leads to this. But universities from the Ivy League to the community college to the land grant to the small liberal arts are all actually having this conversation. So um, even though exciting. still and on an institutional level there are so many disincentives to this, um, there seems to be a broader movement in higher education toward 
really supporting and advancing community-engaged teaching, scholarship, and research. Yeah, and our, our new um, strategic plan is very, I mean, it hasn't formally been released, but it's very, a very change makers for changing world, AU being part of DC, right? In DC, in DC, not whatever, of DC, not in DC, or whatever the, the, the catchphrase is, it's great. Um, and so it's a really exciting time. Um, so the, the first bullet here is, is what Gary was just talking about. How do we implement these recommendations of sort of evaluating community-engaged teaching and scholarship in our reappointment and promotion? Um, how do we, just as Ann Farron spoke about this morning at the opening plenary, we all want to be, well, I can't speak for you. I love the idea of a scholar-teacher mm. ideal. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard to do in as one person. I wish there was four of me. Um, so how do we support faculty in, in really maximizing this ideal? I have this wish list that I just mention every opportunity I'm in front of an audience. <laughs> Car share fund. Yeah, yeah. It takes an hour and a half on Metro to get to Ward 7 and 8, where the yeah. sort of more underserved communities are. That is not possible. So, so we've been trying to pay for car share, and it's so expensive. And I, don't, I think we're going to have to not be working in Ward 7 anymore or Ward 8 because it's so expensive to use car for us to pay for car share. So I want um, a donor to uh, create a car share fund so, so students can get to the communities where we can have some, some impact. Uh, one dean, I won't mention names, mentioned possibility of capping class, classroom sizes so to encourage, which is hard to do. We have classroom space issues, blah, blah, blah. I understand. The blah, blah, blah isn't dismissive. It's sort of like, I know it's an et cetera list of challenges of capping classes, but I think it's really powerful because you can't, the first year I was supposed to do this, they said I would have 50 students and I'd be like walking into a nonprofit with like 50 students being like, hi, we're here to help. That's not going to work, right? You can't do that. So um, I've restructured things so that we don't do that. But um, in the past, Marcy and I have talked about in the past, there was like I don't know, $500 stipend that you could get if you were going to transform your class to community-based learning because it does take you to buy some books to like understand the philosophy. You might need to you know pay for some things. Um, we've also been in conversations with interim provost Mary Clark about an award at the fact at the university level around community-engaged um, teaching or research. It's been approved. Oh, and it's 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 no longer on the wish list. It's on the it's happening list. Um, and then how do we talk about this in our FARS? So um, the, for those who aren't faculty or who are new, that's our annual reporting on sort of like why we're so great, where you get an opportunity to brag about all the great things you've done. I've had people tell me like, oh, CBRS, that's great. Just put that under service. And I'm like, but it's also teaching and research, so I don't know where to put it. So again, how do we really highlight this stuff and get the credit where credit's due? We wanted to briefly talk about external funding. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but there, I have been in peer review. Um, this is a little wonky, but yeah. um, uh, I've peer reviewed NIJ grants around researcher practitioner partnerships. That's National Institute of Justice. National Institute of Health has lots of researcher practitioner community based participatory research grants. NSF is the last acronym, and they're also <laughs> moving in this direction. And then the one that I recently got was the Center for Victim Research uh, Researcher Practitioner Partnerships. So funders are interested in this and want to see that this is happening. Mm -hmm. And so um, as our university moves to be, to be highlighting more external funding, this is exciting. It's just a shift in funding. Like what would it mean to actually give an honorarium to community partners for taking the time to meet with you? You know, that hasn't uh, traditionally been part of what you actually allocate money for. But if community partners are taking out time to really teach young people about how their organization works and about what the struggles are, then they're taking time away from their other underfunded work. Right. So what would kind of honorariums or stipends look like where people are remuner remunerated for their expertise, even as working on a mutually beneficial project? Yeah, and as a faculty member, you kind of get credit for getting external funding for doing this, this work. So we have a couple of guiding questions leading into our last activity. It's noon. I want to say if any of you have any anxiety about Kehoe Kim's announcement this morning that if you're not down at lunch soon enough, you're going to have to sit in the overflow room. We will let you out on time. Mm -hmm. so don't, or even don't, a little early. Or even a little early because none of us want to be in the overflow room. The tavern does not have alcohol anymore like it used to, so there's no other incentive to be there. Um, <laughs> so I have a few. I, I just wanted to throw out there that we need kind of very specific things, and Jane has, you know, got them delineated. Um, but I also feel like there's a whole intellectual space that's needed where, um, you know, in certain disciplines or language, um, language disciplines or humanities or sciences, people are thinking about how their own academic scholarship is moving this direction um, and what would it look like to have it um, 
measured for success. There is a myth that community-based research is not its service. It's not teaching or research. That's the first myth. But also that um, it, if it is counted, it's just kind of counted you know, generically. There is good and bad community-based teaching and research. So it's not all good or all bad. So it has its own metric needs, its own metrics of excellence and accounting and success, but they're different than our current ones. So we need to kind of expand our notions of excellence and success that would kind of vary project to project, discipline to dis discipline. What if the community partners were part of assessing a project and that went into your file or your tenure file or whatever your reappointment file could be? That's awesome. Um, so a collective iterative dialogic process to assess, enhance, and support community-engaged scholarship. CTRL has heroically offered even some funding to, to um, gather literature reviews that are discipline-specific and references about how this works in different disciplines, um, but also think through workshops, troubleshooting, kind of a, a community of people who are engaged in this in different departments and realms as we advance it. So now it's your all's turn. Can I just add something to that? I think one of the pieces that is likely to come out of the strategic plan is an office of external partnerships. And one thing, just referring back to what you said, is to be mapping what's going on around the campus that is engaging with DC, nonprofits, schools, you know, organizations, so that one, there can be more coordination and sharing, and also we can look better at impact rather than, you know, this class is over there or this department's over here, and we're just kind of doing it on a very individualistic basis rather than thinking collectively like, if engaging with DC is important because there's so many inequities in the city and we're all doing this stuff, we need to, we really need to coordinate how yeah. we do it. Right. So I'm hoping that that's one of the things we'll see next week when the strategic plan is released. Yeah, that's great. Diane? I don't know if it's appropriate for questions or not, but what happens when the community is not in DC? So, so yeah. Garrett, obviously you've done a lot of work where you're not sort of physically in DC. Right. So yeah. with, with all of the kind of arrangements and I, I yes. mean, I, sort of. There's the student. There's this the course, which is a, which is students are involved with, and then there's community-based research. Right. But how do you yeah. negotiate non-DC, very far away from DC organizations and communities? Yeah. Key question. And there's not one answer for mine. Even though you had people in the far rural corners of the country, they all were trying to communicate with their little tiny understaffed headquarters in DC to influence the farm bill. So they were still interested in conveying their stories and their information and learning about USDA data so that they could be in conversation with DC. So that kind of justified us being in DC and them you know, learning from us and that organization. But DC is also the home of you know, even like the World Bank or IMF or these amazing Oxfam NGOs. So um, there could be a way to partner with DC-based organizations. But in terms of the international dimension, um, there's actually examples of this. Um, you know, but they would take more coordination. So I feel like that could be a whole component of this intellectual community is the international dimension of this. I've had a couple of students do capstones abroad. In their, while they're abroad, they partner with a nonprofit, but usually the abroad program already had existing relations with nonprofits. So I'm like, don't just land somewhere and be like, hi. Yeah. You know, you have to build those relationships and that trust. So, um, but I know that's not exactly what you're talking about. There could be virtual ways of engaging. Um, but it's it's more challenging. Well, I mean, they all have they all have their unique challenges. So speaking of challenges, we're going to talk uh, briefly. We're going to do another posted activity for about five minutes, and then just have about five minutes for discussion and maybe more questions. Um, and then also feel free to contact us anytime. Yes. Uh, with questions, Jane Bat Palmer at American, Grady at American. <laughs> and so we're going to talk about okay. You don't want to just talk about challenges and then be like, okay, great, there's some challenges. What do we do about it? How do we address it? We have strategies to address challenges, either ones we've discussed sort of as a group or ones that are on the post-its. And then generally, we want to talk strategies to advance community-based research and community-engaged learning at AU. Think about specific sort of asks. What is your wish list? If you had, if you wanted to implement next spring, not, you know, not, not next week, but next spring, a community project, what would you need to support you between now and then to be able to do that? What are you missing? How can we help? How can Marcy's office help? How can the provost's office help? How can your deans help? Your chairs? Your colleagues? So take your post-its um, and write down any strategies you think of to address challenges or strategies to continue the great work we're doing and do it even better.